Well, good morning, church, and welcome to our midweek devotion. It is Ash Wednesday. It is the first Wednesday devotion that we'll have in this Lenten season together. And it's a little bit of a change in the structure of how we've been doing things. Um, over the next few weeks, the next really seven weeks of, uh, or seven Wednesdays at least in Lent, uh, we are going to be reflecting on Stanley Hauerwas's Cross Shattered Christ. Uh, if you would like a copy of this book, um, I have a few at the church still. Um, they're also available online, I think through Amazon, uh, as well as through some of the used uh, book websites that are out there. Um, but it's a great little devotional. Uh, it, it's thought-provoking. Um, it's theological in its writing. Uh, and we'll get into it in a minute. Um, but this is what our focus is going to be on Wednesdays uh, for this Lenten season. Uh, the other thing I want to go ahead and tell you is that if you are sitting on the edge of your seat waiting for these to appear at 11 o'clock on Wednesdays, which is when I release them uh, into the cyber world, um, during Lent I'm actually going to have them released a little bit earlier. Uh, and that's for a couple of reasons. One, um, I, I want folks to be able to come to our midday, our, our 12 o'clock gatherings, having seen the video. And if I wait to release it at 11 o'clock, that limits the amount of time folks would have had. And that's that's really the main reason. So throughout Lent, um, the these Wednesday devotions, that our Wednesday videos are going to be released a little earlier in the morning, probably by about 9 o'clock, um, so that folks are able to, to preview them, see them, and then come to that time together during our Lenten luncheons with a little bit of, of understanding already of what it is we'll be talking about. And that way for folks that aren't following along with the book, they'll at least know, hey, this was this was the passage for the week. This was um, what Howard Wass was writing about, what you know I had to say about it. And then we can kind of begin our conversations from there on Wednesdays. But we will be having our Wednesday luncheons. They'll be noon to about 12.45 or so. So just a, a short period together where we can come together in prayer, come together in reflection um, on these words spoken by Jesus during this Lenten season. Um, so this is, again, just a practice for us during Lent uh, to, to focus on, on these seven last words of Jesus. And before we get into that, I want to just kind of quickly go through uh, something else. We have this uh, the 40 days to Easter, 40 days um, of devotions as well that are available for you. I've got some here in the office. I've got uh, most of them over in the church narthex, and so when you join us on Sunday or if you join us this afternoon at noon or at six for our Ash Wednesday services, um, you can pick up a copy of this. And this is just a, a Monday through Saturday devotion that you can read during the Lenten season. Unfortunately, there's some copyright things in play where I can't put this out um, on Facebook the way I did last year with the, uh, the Henry um, Nowen. Um, devotion that we use. So I, I can't just put this out there on on Facebook. Um, I can put the scripture references out there. I can put the scripture itself out there, but the meditation itself and the prayer, I can't. So I'll, I'll put the scriptures there. That'll come, and I come out first thing each morning as well, and you'll be able to read along what the scripture passages are at least, uh, but it won't have the, the reflections there with you. Um, so just know that. I've got a bunch of these, though, that are available. If you'd like one, um, we've got them here at the church for you. This is a great way to, uh, to practice a Lenten discipline, um, a discipline that I hope will then carry on throughout the rest of the year of spending your day, starting your day, really, in prayer and in Scripture uh, and reflecting on His Word. Um, that's something that we all should be doing. And Lent is a good time, if you're not already doing that, to start that practice by committing these 40 days to doing that. Um, just so y'all know as well, you're going to see kind of a weekly schedule coming out uh, of, of how we're going to be going through Cross Shattered Christ. There's not a luncheon today. There's not a luncheon at noon today because we're having an Ash Wednesday service. Um, there will be a luncheon beginning next week, uh, which is March 9th, and at that point we'll cover in our discussion... Um, chapters 1 and 2, the first and second words spoken. Um, that'll be our in-person kind of event around this. Uh, but today's video will also cover the introduction and the first week, chapter 1, um, of the book. So 
join us at noon. Join us this evening at 6 for the Ash Wednesday service. I will probably reflect on this to some extent in my homily. Um, but then the discussions on Wednesday noon to 1245 or so will be kind of coinciding with the calendar that you'll see in the bulletins and coming out via email as well. And I'll put that up on the on the Facebook page um, and I can try and put a link to that or uh, add that to the description on, on YouTube as well. Um, as we get closer to Holy Week, I'll give you all the schedule of all that. But just know that as we enter this Lenten season, um, spend some extra time praying. Spend some extra time uh, in devotion and prayer and, and reading the scriptures. Uh, you will be blessed by doing that. Um, I, I, in this first day, have already been blessed by, by what I've read in this book and preparing what it is that I want to share with you all this morning. So jumping into that now, um, the the introduction. I, I love how Harawas, Stanley Harawas introduces this book right in the opening sentences and in the introduction. I think he kind of hits the nail on the head with with several things. One, um, something that I think that that we can use in apologetics, we can use in our evangelism, we can use in conversations with folks that are new to Christianity or that are questioning Christianity. Uh, and and it, it's something you'll hear me probably use in the future as well. I liked it so much. He says in that introduction, to say that what Christians believe is mysterious invites the assumption that what we believe is not believable. In short, mystery suggests that what we believe defies reason and common sense. What we believe does defy reason and common sense. But yet I believe what Christians believe is the most reasonable and common sense account we can have of the way things are. And again, you think back to any of the arguments, any of the conversations we've had or you've had with folks about why is it that you believe it doesn't make any sense. I think Harawas uh, hits it on the head in that final statement that believing what Christians believe is actually the most reasonable and common sense account of why things are the way they are in the world today. Why is the world such a sinful place? Why is there so much pain and hurt and, and just bad stuff going on in the world that we see today? Well, it's because of that sin. It's that fallen brokenness that came into the world right after creation, that man brought into it through the temptation that, that we saw of Adam and Eve and that the devil ushered in. And uh, it's only redeemable through Jesus Christ. And we see a difference in those who live for Christ and those who don't. There's a noticeable difference when you look at the lives of Christians versus the lives of, of non-Christians. And, and I think that Harawas picks up on that and says that it, of course, is the most reasonable and common sense account for why things are the way they are. He goes on... Um, and I really do want to preface this about um, these videos, about our discussion um, during our, our luncheon series as well. Uh, he, he says that this is not, his writing is not an explanation per se of what Jesus says as much as it is a meditation on those words. Um, and I'm going to quote him again here. He, he believes that explanations, if we were to write it as an explanation, oh, this is what Jesus meant, it makes Jesus conform to our understanding of things and that this, in many ways, domesticates and tames the wildness of the God we worship. And I think, again, that's true. We try and shape it into something that we can grasp. We try and shape Jesus into a man that we can understand or would would you know, want him to be as opposed to seeing him for who he truly is. And our attempts to offer those explanations often, as, as Harold Walsh writes, domesticate and tame the wildness of the God that we worship. Um, I, I thought that was a, a brilliant uh, sentence and a great way of putting it. Uh, this, of course, and, and he acknowledges this, means that, that his writing in here can be a little more difficult to understand. It's not breaking it down to some simple level of explanation as much as it is a theological reflection um, on these words themselves. And so that causes us, it caused him uh, to think deeper, uh, to, to really try to process this, and, and that can be a challenge. I will tell you right now, 
I had to read it twice. I had to look at the, you know, the five or six pages on these first words of Jesus. Um, and I had to read it twice and go back and underline things and make sure that I was really getting the gist of what it was that Harawas wrote. Um, and he, he, he finishes up that introduction uh, saying that this process, this difficult process of understanding this, this kind of theological process of going through all this understanding, it can be painful for us to acknowledge the reality of the Father's sacrifice of the Son on the cross. And again, I thought that was just a brilliant way of putting it. We get frustrated. I, I thought, oh, I'll just read this real quick. I'll be able to draft some notes and I'll make a video. No, I had to read it a couple times. I had to think through it. I had to put it down for a little while before I read it the second time and, and think about it and chew on those words uh, to really grasp what it was that Jesus meant in those first words that we reflect on this week. And as we go, I pray that process will be a little easier for us but if it's not, I hope it's that reminder that he says uh, about that painful acknowledgement of what it was God the Father is going through with God the Son on the cross. Well, the first words that we do reflect on in uh, chapter 1 are, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Now, this comes from, I probably should have looked this one up before I started taping, uh, <laughs> I believe this comes from, yeah, Luke. This is Luke 23, um, where we see Jesus say these words. And, of course, those references are right there. That's also on the calendar that you all will, will see and, and receive. Um, it has the scripture references. So from Luke 23, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Well, Harawas begins uh, this devotion, these first words, and he paints a picture right off the bat of uh, holding... A dying person, holding a feeble person, or perhaps holding a newborn child in, in your arms. Well, that was an image that stuck with me because I've done that. I've held newborn children in my arms, my own two sons uh, as well as my daughter. But that first time, that very first time that I was handed my sons, when I was handed Hank and Huck, you know, initially kind of one and then the other, and then at one point both at the same time, it's this memorable moment, but it was also daunting. And I think that's the picture that Harawas is trying to paint, is that, that daunting moment where we realize that we have this precious life in our hands, and now what? Now what do we do? Now how do we process this? We, Trish and I, became responsible for those lives before then, of course, throughout the pregnancy, but in that moment, it became real for me that I have to feed and clothe and provide for these two children. For one child can be daunting enough, but of course in our case having twins, how are we going to do this? How 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 do we do this? I mean, parents have been doing this since the beginning of time, but I think again, the first time you feel that, you see that you have that experience, it can be daunting. Now I have to raise these two boys and of course later our daughter in this crazy crazy world that we live in. And Harawas uses these words, uh, he paints this picture um, because he says that, that the words spoken by Jesus are cross-shaped words. They're spoken in agony, that same kind of daunting sense of what is next, what is next for these people. Uh, and they invoke that same kind of feeling, at least as Harawas put it, and as I began to imagine in my mind, that same kind of daunting task of, of looking at precious life and understanding the weight of it all. The weight of all that life that, that Jesus in that moment was responsible for. The, the weight of the life of my children that I became responsible for in those moments. He adds, um, and again, I'm going to quote from the book from time to time. So he adds, to comprehend these words, we rightly fear would threaten all that we hold dear. That is, the every day. These words threaten our every day, 
our every day is just kind of the normalcy of life. We could go on about our lives. We can live for a job, a career. We can live for money. We can live for experiences. But when we fully grasp what these words mean and what they say, then we realize that we're no longer in the ordinary. We're now in the extraordinary. We're now in a life with Christ where what he does is something that is so important for us. And what we witness in these moments is something that is so unique. This is the death of the Son of God. That is what we're seeing is the death of the Son of God. Now, again, I think that we have to acknowledge here, and this is the where Hauerwas is taking us in this first um, meditation, is that what we're witnessing here is not actually between us and God. We witness it. We are fortunate third parties to, to, and observers to hear these words, to have them recorded. It's a privilege for us to have that. You know, we are the fly on the wall in this moment, so to speak. But what's actually taking place has to do with the relationship between the Son and the Father. It's an intimate relationship that exists between the two. We're seeing the Son speak out in agony, that daunting moment where he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. It's conversation between him and God the Father in heaven. And... I think as Harawas takes this, and as I understood it, um, as soon as these words from the cross are bent to serve our needs, as soon as we insert ourselves into that and see ourselves as the them who know not what they're doing, then we, we, we view a God giving us what we believe it is we need. And Harawas goes on and says, it's almost impossible to resist entertaining ourselves with speculative readings of Jesus' words from the cross. Ironically, by trying to understand what it means for us to need forgiveness, too often our attention becomes focused on something called the human condition rather than the cross and our God that is upon it. We insert ourselves into the story. We make it about me. We make it about us. We make it the human condition. And what happens is we become the center of it when we do that. We become at the center of the story and we forget that this is that intimate moment between the Father and the Son and that there's so much more to what is happening at this time. When we put ourselves at the center of it, we make it about our sins, my redemption. We lose sight of the fact that this is actually about all of creation. Everything that was made was made through him. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. We lose sight of the big picture around all of that. It's not about me. It's about everything. Everything. What the Father and the Son accomplished together and continue to accomplish together. Well, Hauerwas references a few other folks throughout these um, teachings, and he references a guy named von Balthasar who says the redeeming act consists in a wholly unique bearing of the total sin of the world by the Father's wholly unique Son, whose God-manhood is alone capable of such an office. And again, those words right there jumped off the page to me. The redeeming act consists in the wholly unique bearing of the total sin of the world. Not my sin, not your sin, not any individual's, but the total sin of the world for all ages, from the beginning of time to when Christ comes again. All the sin of the whole world is there in that weight on the cross when Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. And it's only through his unique position, and I love, again, as Balthasar writes, whose God-manhood, fully God and fully man, he is alone capable of such a position, such an office, to be the one on that cross. So as Christians, as believers, for us, what we see taking place on the cross, to have witnessed those words as the you know third party, the fly on the wall, to see that conversation between Father 
and son, it tells us that we have a responsibility about how we live our lives. And Harawas goes on and gives an example of, of uh, a Trappist monk, I believe, who, who kind of lived into that. And he, he writes that in the confidence that Jesus, the only son of God alone, has the right to ask the Father to forgive people like us who would kill rather than face death. Not only those who were killing him that day, but all of us who in our words, in our minds, in our thoughts, kill on a regular basis. We would rather do that than face death because we don't fully understand what that means, what that would bring us. But that is why we're drawn to the cross, why we rightly remember Jesus' words in the hopes that we might be for the forgiveness made through the cross of Christ, that we would live into that mission that we are called to, live into that forgiveness, share that good news, and understand what it means to have been redeemed by that. Well, I want to close this morning um, saying the collect that we will pray in just a little while uh, in our Ash Wednesday service. Uh, we will, uh, in the subsequent weeks, use the collects for the Sundays and Lent to close out our time um, in, in prayer and in meditation together. But I want to use the Ash Wednesday uh, one today. So please pray with me. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing you have made, and you forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain of you the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen.